Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so today I will present a few um, developments that we have uh, done on explainable AI, trying to take into account uh, higher order interactions in the model and also produce explanations that are disentangled and overall we want explanations to be more um, actionable than the one we currently have now. So I'll start with some uh, motivation example of uh, what kind of uh, uh, application we are aiming for, uh, especially in the context of using explainable AI for scientific applications, so for extracting uh, uh, insights in the data. And um, this is a first work uh, that we published last year uh, by Philippe Kail, and uh, it's a collaboration with some people in Berlin, also in, uh, in Munich, with also Frederic Clausen, who gave the talk uh, yesterday. So what we want to do is to try to find uh, influential uh, proteins in uh, signaling networks. And here you have, for example, an example of um, the mTOR uh, signaling network, which you can find on some knowledge base like reactome.org. And um, basically, these signal networks are identifying proteins that, that mutually interact, and uh, they are the aggregation of many research works. And the question we have been asking is whether we can infer some of these uh, links between protein just uh, by looking at the data, large amounts of data. And so the first step we have taken is to build a model which uh, mutually predicts uh, the activation of, of proteins um, from other proteins. So we have basically a network which is composed of uh, a vector of protein values on one side and another vector of protein values on the other side. And um, some of these protein values are hidden and we are basically have to predict the ones that are hidden. So this gives us um, a model uh, but it does not tell us much about how these things actually interact because for a given prediction, um, many um, different proteins are being involved. And um, we would like to basically be able to identify uh, what contributes uh, for what. And uh, this can be done using an attribution method. And here we have used a technique called layer-wise sort of propagation or LRP. And basically, each of these predicted protein values are being decomposed onto the predictors, so the, basically the proteins received as inputs. And then we can do that over many um, combinations of proteins. Sometimes we can like uh, hide a uh, few of them and then just randomize again which one we hide and which we do not hide. We generate a lot of this attribution. And all this attribution at the end can be um, put into a matrix of size um, proteins times proteins. And uh, basically, this matrix kind of gives us a scoring, which uh, we would like to use uh, for uh, verifying or discovering potential uh, interactions. And this is basically the kind of uh, outputs that our uh, method gives us. And uh, basically, here, every subplot is a protein-protein interaction, um, like a, basically a protein-protein uh, protein, protein interaction. And here we are extracting the top ones and um, basically it highlights some uh, interesting uh, pairs of protein, which often corresponds to uh, what we have in knowledge bases. Also, it highlights this mTOR pathway, which is relevant for cancer. And um, what we get additionally is that we not only get like a ranking of proteins from relevant to not relevant, we also can uh, filter out our analysis per um, cancer type or uh, even per, per, per data points. Um, so unlike methods based on simple correlations, we can really um, have a um, single case, single instance analysis of, of interactions. And um, yeah, so basically we, we check whether there is some actual relation between, between um, what our algorithm discovers as a protein interactions and um, the ground truth we use from the reactome.org, and we could see some, some correlation. 
So, so far, um, explainable AI provides um, single instance and nonlinear uh, explanations, which allows us to contextualize the data point and to find what is relevant uh, in a specific um, context, in a specific region of our input space. And there's been already a number of uh, applications uh, that uh, could provide some interesting insights. Um, but one aspect is that um, sometimes we know um, where things are relevant in the inputs, but we don't really exactly know for which, which reason. And sometimes we also can see, for example, for molecule that maybe atoms are are basically given a score, but what might be the most uh, explicative um, pattern is not the atom itself, but more combination of different atoms. And these are things that a classical explanation method uh, cannot provide easily, because usually uh, these classical explanation methods attributes not on pairs of or triplets or combination of uh, features, but more single features. So this is basically what we've been looking at them. And um, the first um, technical um, developments that we have been proposing uh, is uh, to um, produce higher order explanations. And we have uh, applied that in the context of graph neural networks. So what is a graph neural network? You have your uh, input, which is basically a graph. And it can be represented by some uh, adjacency matrix, lambda. And um, what is interesting about graph neural network is that um, the input is not at layer zero, like most of the neural networks otherwise, but it actually appears at every layer. And in fact, it is not just added, it is multiplied. So if you, even if you consider very simple interactions, like linear interactions or um, yeah, linear functions, then this multiplication implies that your basically outputs becomes um, not uh, lin linear or piecewise linear with the, with the input graph, but uh, multilinear or polynomial. So if we just take a very simple polynomial or a simple multilinear function here, uh, it is basically f of x, which is the product of two features, input features plus x extreme. Then, um, so assume that x1 is 4, x2 is 1, and x3 is 2, then it's, it's pretty unambiguous that uh, if the output of the function is 6, uh, then we should attribute uh, um, 2 to the third feature, because it's an addition. That's what most explanation method does. But when you have a product, uh, it's a little bit more ambiguous, uh, because Following certain arguments, if we would say, okay, well, we would just approximate that as a sum, um, then we would rather give more attribution, more score to this one, x1, and less to x2. But you can also um, think of it from the aspect, more like game theory perspective, where um, x2 and x1 are both able to uh, reduce, reduce this, the function in the same amount if they just uh, withdraw, they set themselves to zero. In which case, it would be um, more reasonable to set them um, to equal value, for example, two and two. But even if we, we settle this issue, um, we still might still want to go for higher order attribution because then we really have um, additional information, which is that the two features do not contribute individually, but they contribute uh, jointly to the prediction. So instead of having this kind of histograms, you would like to start to draw arcs between features that indicate uh, the joint contributions. And also one thing which is um, what we notice is that sometimes it's not so much the user who can decide whether it should be first order or higher order attribution, it's more property of the model. So if we have like a linear uh, function, there's no, not very much points to we use higher order uh, attribution. But if we have to sort of have like some interaction between features, then um, it makes sense to use higher order attributions. So this is just to illustrate uh, the approach that we have been uh, taking. And uh, this is in a graph neural network. This is a very simplified graph neural network. 
where you have basically your, your input, which is multiplied by some matrix uh, lambda, which is the adjacency matrix in the graph, and it does some kind of message passing, and then multiplication by some weight in the matrix, which kind of just updates the representation for a given node. And then you have the nonlinearity, and you apply this function multiple times. And, and each layer basically kind of produce a new representation of the nodes, and then you might have, for example, a pooling. So here it's a bit difficult to extract this uh, interaction because essentially you would, you would need to attribute a score to each index i, j, and k in your, in your um, graph, but you don't have this structure exactly because of the nonlinearity rule. What we decided to is to do it um, iteratively. So we start from the output, and from the output, we explain the output, we attribute on the lambda jk, which are basically the matrix of adjacencies as we see it in the second layer. Once we have the attribution score, we express them as a function of the adjacencies in the lower layer, and then we run an attribution of RJK onto these adjacencies. And now we get basically an adjacency or a relevant score, which is basically for all the, for the pipelet IJK. And what we found out is for some simple class of functions, so this is the simplest, but we have also something a bit more um, involved in the, in the paper. Then the iterative attribution produces exactly the same results as uh, if you unroll the whole computation, it's a big sum over all the indices, and then takes elements of the sum. And so here, this rijk are basically the same as the rijk which you have here in the sum. So at least for simple model, it it reduces to what we would expect from a higher order explanation. But the fact that we have it re recursively or iteratively means that it's easier to integrate in existing architecture. We don't need to kind of rewrite the network in some flattened way. We can directly perform the computation one after the other. So this is basically what happens if we then cast it into an existing algorithm such as LRP? Basically, we have the propagation, which, which goes backward from the nodes. And then instead of just propagating and taking all the signal backwards, we essentially follow, we filter out what um, basically we don't want to attribute to. And uh, basically, it will follow the, for, for, for example, interaction between nodes K, uh, L, K, and J. Basically, you will follow this path, but filter what belongs to this node here because it does not, it is not basically part of this interaction term. So these are basically different propagation rules for different architecture, for different graph neural networks. And um, then what we get as a result is um, a propagation procedure so we start with the input graph, then we have some interaction layers, which basically multiply the states of the network by the input graph. Then we have our prediction. And then if we apply this algorithm, we have called GNN LRP, which is a variant of LRP where we basically filter um, the um, signal that is propagated backward to only pass through the terms which forms or interaction, then we start with nodes, then we propagate them into edges. So each edge is now given a score, and then we further propagate them into pairs of edges, which gives us basically walks in the graph. So what we could find is that if this network is, if this input is created in a certain way, the explanation takes the form of walks in the input graph. So in, in practice, um, you have to repeat uh, the LRP process with a different filtering for, for all the possible works. That's exponentially complex, and um, this is quite expensive. In practice, 
you can often coarse grain your input graph. For example, maybe you are interested mostly in the region of this graph where you have this, uh, this anomaly. And um, then instead of having like walks on between all the nodes, you basically only have walks that kind of get out of some coarser nodes and then only are properly resolved in the region of interest. So we did some further work on that, how to um, accelerate explanation to basically um, by putting the focus only on what we are interested uh, in uh, for a given task. OK, so now comes the question of how to evaluate higher order explanations, because even though they might look appealing visually, it is not uh, sufficient. We would like to verify that they really uh, faithfully represent uh, the function. And um, a standard explanation technique or frequently used explanation technique is called pixel flipping. And, um, Pixel flipping consists of adding nodes by order of relevance or removing them and try to basically verify that the first nodes that it has selected or the first input features which are selected are indeed relevant. And we can verify this by verifying that the function changes very rapidly at the beginning and then changes less. But this is only possible for a first order explanations, because um, we have basically this attribution on mutual features. So for first order explanations, it's easy. You can just add different nodes, one after the other, and then measure the area under the curve. Um, so our idea was let's say, OK, well, let's not look at relevant scores in terms of individual nodes or in terms of pairs of nodes will generalize the notion of relevance to subsets of features. So basically, we will say that the relevance of a specific subset of feature is the relevance of all the nodes or all the edges or all the pairs of edges or all the walks that are part of that subset. In this way, we have the same representation for first order methods and for higher order methods. So now comes the question, what do we do with this um, relevance on a subset of features? And what we can do is to ask, basically, uh, the explanation to produce a um, sequence of nodes, which is optimal when considering adding them in the pixel flipping experiment. So from this subset of features, we now try to find some argmax over a sequence where we basically add features one after the other. So in practice, it's exponentially complex, but we can approximate this procedure with some greedy uh, feature selection or uh, some randomization approaches. And with this, we are now able to compare higher order explanation methods with the first order ones. And so we have tried to do that for simple explanation method that decompose the output onto layer zero. This is basically vanilla gradient times inputs or vanilla LRP. Then the same explanation method, but the version which basically follows the different walks in the graph, and which are higher order methods. And finally, a popular method for explaining graph neural networks, which is called the GMN explainer. And what we could find is that um, our gene LRP methods uh, could uh, quite consistently perform better than first-order methods on a number of, uh, of models. And it is not only beneficial compared to first-order methods, but also we see that the advantage of methods such as LRP compared to simpler methods like gradient sums inputs carry out in the higher-order setting. OK, so now we've been looking at some use case for this higher order explanation. And um, we have been interested in using it in the context of quantum chemistry. And we did some preliminary experiments uh, verifying uh, whether we get some additional information 
by looking at different um, degree of explanation. So here, it is a whole uh, higher order decomposition uh, of order three, but which we filter to um, consider whether the walks stay within one edge, one node, or whether it traverses one edge, or whether it traverses two edges, or whether it traverses three edges. And what we can see is that depending on which type of interaction we look at in our explanation, things are qualitatively quite different. And we see, for example, that this one edge walk has a very specific pattern. Here we are basically explaining polarizability in terms of uh, the input features. And same for the three edge walk. And on the other hand, we don't see this kind of polarized pattern in this uh, zero edge and two edge walks. Mm. So that's basically additional information that the explanation provides. On the other hand, um, the explanation is also much larger. So it makes it also a bit more difficult to comprehend for, uh, for a human. So a, a general uh, comment about XAI. So basically, it's just to say that um, we are still uh, very interested in, uh, in working on, on this topic. And we are looking at some uh, ways to achieve, um, to try to further improve interpretability of these higher order explanations. A general comment about XAI um, is that um, we need to make a distinction between interpreting the physics or uh, interpreting what the model, the strategy the model uses to predict some the physical properties. Uh, and uh, specifically in, in the context of quantum chemistry, um, the model you very often develop strategies which are applicable to specific um, subsets of data but which will not generalize to, um, to a broader range of molecules or um, deformations of these molecules. So um, often these um, insights might be data set specific and we have to be always a bit careful about trying to extract physical insights from them. So basically like, like for the protein proteomics case, uh, it's a um, tool to generate insights or, or hypotheses, but then they, this hypothesis they need to be verified by uh, targeted uh, experiments. So this was for higher order uh, explanations. And now we've been looking at uh, something else, which is um, disentangled explanation. It's a very uh, recent paper. We submitted it last month. And um, it also um, starts from um, an observation of uh, some limits of uh, classical explanations. And here we have some image of basketball predicted by the network to be basketball. And um, what we can observe, and it's also a remark that uh, Wojciech made in his talk uh, on Tuesday, that um, very often um, multiple concepts are entangled in the same explanation. And um, sometimes some, they can be still disentangled like just by looking at them, if we know something about this concept. But sometimes we also don't really know, for example, here, it might be the circular shape, but it might also be the color. Mm -hmm. So as, as Wojciech mentioned uh, two days ago, um, these um, classical explanations have some limits. So now what we want to do, we would like to be able to disentangle this explanation in some systematic way um, by uh, automatically extracting the multiple concepts that are forming the explanation. So we can think of them as like sub-strategies that the neural network uses um, to produce this uh, the prediction. And um, essentially imagine like an image which consists of a rectangle and circle. This image is predicted as a, as a rectangle maybe because the class circle does not exist uh, in this model. Um, and um, then we would like to be able to kind of disentangle the various components um, uh, that are basically predictive of rectangle. And maybe the circle is weakly predictive because 
It's also a geometric shape. The rectangle might appear simultaneously with, um, with circles. Uh, but we would like to put a strong focus on what is truly relevant. Uh, so, for example, not paying too much attention to the circle and really try to identify the different concept concepts within the rectangle, for example, distinguishing between um, corners and, um, and, um, uh, and, and edges. So our idea is to um, um, leverage the internal structure of the, of the model um, and try to identify in some latent representation um, some uh, sets of variables. Uh, um, you can think of them as, as subspaces uh, uh, that basically um, allow for such disentanglement. And so this is the notation that we use. So we have basically some input, which is mapped to some activations or some other concepts, HK. And then this HK then uh, goes to the outputs. And the standard explanation would be to simply take the variable Y and then attribute it to the different input features XI. What we do instead is to first uh, try to attribute on RK, on, on, sorry, on HK, and then once we have the attribution, you can think of it as a function of uh, the input, it's a function of x, and then we are basically attributing this rk on the on the xi's. So it's a two-step attribution process, quite similar to the two-step attribution process we had when trying to produce higher order explanations. But here, you only have like one, one input on this x, and uh, this hk is, is more like a latent variable. So it's not a real input, it's something that we that we are basically a building in the model. So now these concepts are actually not necessarily um, directly available or in a nice disentangled in activation space. And what we want, we would like to be able to find projections in activation space that basically uh, support the, the concepts that are relevant for, for a given task. And so this is a bit of notation. So we denote by A or vector of activation at some given layer of the network. Then for if we apply LRP until this layer A, then we get uh, relevant scores. We can write them into a vector R. And an important quantity in our analysis is uh, what we call uh, the complex vector, which is a, a vector such that when you multiply it by A, by the activation, then you get the relevant scores. And when you apply layer-wise relevant propagation or other techniques like integrated gradients or gradient times input, very often you have this, this structure. We can decompose the relevance into these terms, which means that we can basically collect this vector C for every data point and for every task. And now you have basically this matrices, so UK, which is um, a collection of uh, matrices and they are mutually orthogonal, and they also form a complete basis, which means that even though your network might not have these concepts, you can basically project using U and then back project, and you basically just get A back. Um, this is a property for method. We really force the projection to be uh, orthogonal so that we can invert it back to activations. We can think of it as some kind of virtual uh, layer which is here not for the purpose of altering the prediction, but just uh, changing, deviating the, the explanation. OK. And now comes the key uh, finding of our work, okay, is that if we now perform LRP or other explanation techniques until RK, so basically our layer where we would like to have the concept, so we find that uh, this uh, RK can be always written in this form a projection of the activation times a projection of uh, this complex vector. And what does that mean? Is that we have a way, kind of a link between the projection and the relevant scores. So now we can build analysis that allows us to find uh, the UKs, the projections that maximize some statistic of the, of the relevances in this layer. So for example, uh, we have proposed um, different analyses, two analyses. The first one is what we call principal relevant component analysis. And um, 
where basically we would like to find a subspace U which uh, maximizes the, the relevance of an average. And we can express it in a way that is very similar to, to PCA. So basically we have the trace of uh, U transpose a covariance matrix. So here it's a cross covariance matrix between, between activation and context vectors, and then uh, the, the back projection. And basically if we set C being A, so if we assume that the model basically responds directly perfectly aligned with the activation, then uh, we reduce to an uh, uncer uncentered version of PC. So basically this analysis allows us in principle uh, to extract a maximally contributing components because we are essentially maximizing the relevance of that subspace. Now we have proposed a different analysis, which is called, uh, which we call a disentangled relevance subspace analysis. So and here we don't want to maximize relevance, we rather want to find independent components. So independent uh, concepts, or let's say not independent, but more disentangled concepts um, that might capture distinct objects in the, uh, in the, in the image, for example. And uh, we use a um, principle quite similar to what we see in other disentanglement techniques. So we are basically raising, this is a, um, this is a square, um, the squaring full by an expectation. Oh, sorry, second, um, generalization, generalization of the mean, which, which favors uh, peaks of the distribution. Uh, we do it over the data. And then we apply kind of inverse mean, which, which balances um, the different um, concepts K, which we find, and which ensures that not everything gets assigned to, to one, one given concept, and it kind of ensures some spread between the different concepts. And if we set C is equal to A, so if we basically again assume our model perfectly aligns with the activations, uh, then it reduces something that we call DSA, um, and which is quite similar to, to, um, to certain variants of ICA. This is um, on a very simple 2D example, what kind of components is different methods learn? We see that basically PCA captures the, the main direction. DSA tends to focus on one such component. And uh, PRS, PRCA, and DRSA, which are the methods that we have proposed, um, are affected by the, by the direction of the model. So PCA and DSA, if we apply them to activation, they just look at activation, but not the way the model responds to these activations. And here we really have a focus on the model response, which allows us to be more precisely decomposing um, what is relevant for the prediction and not just features in general. This is what we get in practice. So again, our image of basketball players. And um, if we apply PRCA, so basically we have like a first component which captures the bulk of the decision strategy, and then all the remaining components, we can call them a residue, and it captures more like very specific variants of the strategy, for example, the ball, some little logo on the t-shirt, and so on. And if we do DRSA, instead we really have like a semantic decomposition of our explanation, where Subspace 2, for example, looks at the outfits. Subspace 3 looks at the faces of the basketball players. And uh, subspace 4 uh, looks at the, at the ball. And these are all um, components that are relevant for the, for the basketball uh, prediction. Now we try to evaluate this. Um, and um, first, we try to verify whether PRCA really extracts a maximally relevant component. So here we varied, we varied the size of the, of, the, of the subspace. And we can see that from the very onset, PRCA um, outperform simple baselines, for example, standard PCA, or just looking at the most relevant feature maps. So basically here it's just constrained to aligned with the canonical coordinate system, and also random. So we see that really this focus both on being able, the flexibility brought by
focusing on a specific subspace, but also to focus on the relevance rather than the activations is really crucial uh, to get uh, a strongly relevant components. In fact, with only one dimensional subspace, we can already reproduce the total um, relevance found at the output of the model. We try on different models, on different uh, explanation techniques as well. And we find that consistently our methods uh, achieve uh, higher um, scores and, and by, by quite some margin. Then we looked at uh, DRSA. And we would like to verify that our explanation of a given image is indeed is entangled. So we use um, we design a separability score, which is which is for that. Um, we take basically our um, explanations and we look at the maximum of our explanation minus the top explanation, which gives us a score, an area under the curve. And this gives us a separability metric. We normalize it to be one for the random subspace. And we find again that with a slightly uh, lower margin than in the PC PRCA case, uh, our methods can um, produce the best for performance compared to the baselines. OK, so now we consider a few more use cases. And I'll just uh, mention the first two of the three use cases. So, uh, the first one is for um, detecting and removing clever hands in a, in a model. So here we have, for example, images of the class carton. And it seems that the model uses the watermark as evidence for the class carton, which is maybe a good strategy on the ImageNet data set, but which does not generalize as well on new, on new data. And what we found is that by performing our DRS analysis, we basically have like one subspace, which uh, we identify to um, um, to be the clever hand subspace. Hmm. So here, what we can do is simply take this subspace, take it out of the prediction, right? Because basically, you have this conservation property that the, the prediction is basically the sum of the relevances over the different subspaces. So we can just subtract the relevance of, of subspace four from the prediction, and we get a refined model. And we look at the accuracy of the um, refined model versus the original model on some poison data, which is data where basically the spurious correlation has been inverted, where we are putting the watermark on other examples. And we, are, we might remove the watermark from the given examples. So and um, we observed that um, removing this clever hand subspace increased accuracy uh, by, by, by 3.6%. We also find that if we do something else, for example, if we remove subspace one, which is actually containing a useful feature, the accuracy decrease, which is expected. Same for three and uh, for subspace two which is a little bit um, more like a borderline case because it's indeed marking, but we can argue that this marking is actually typical of the class carton, right? Then we also get an improvement, but uh, much less than um, if we really move this, remove this, uh, this obvious uh, clever, clever hands um, subspace. So in practice, we also want to apply uh, XAI uh, for uh, discovering insights in the data, not just correcting models. And uh, we have looked at uh, some class, some subsets of, of classes from the ImageNet data sets, the uh, butterfly classes containing butterflies. And there are various uh, species of butterflies in the, in the ImageNet data set, monarch, admiral, and so on. And what we could find is that basically there are some types of butterfly that, uh, that share some common features. We have basically these different subspaces. So we find, for example, that the species uh, Monarch and Admiral um, share subspace four, which basically reacts to dotted patterns. Mm -hmm. So basically, we get a visu visual feedback of uh, what is uh, distinct, what is unique to specific um, types of butterfly. For example, Admiral seems to have the very unique orange band uh, on the on the wings, uh, and then we can also do things more quantitatively because each 
subspace assigns to uh, a given image a score. So we can build this kind of scatter plots uh, where um, basically each image is resolved by the relevance of the different subspaces. And here, for example, we put projects uh, on subspace 7, subspace 4, and subspace 5. And we see that different classes um, have different distribution in this uh, three dimensional uh, subspace. So that's, that's it. And uh, I'll just quickly summarize. So, what we uh, main direction of our research is to uh, try to make explanations uh, more informative and actionable from the, for the user. And uh, that's uh, what uh, we are trying to do by um, first uh, developing these higher order methods, which aim to ensure that the explanation reflects the use of uh, feature interactions by the model, uh, for example, the graph neural network. And uh, this can also be achieved um, by uh, producing disentangled explanations, where basically we can extract um, the um, latent uh, concepts that are built in the network that are not directly available in terms of activations, but we can recover by computing these uh, projections and um, then uh, obtain these disentangled explanations. Right? And so far, what doing something we have not done, uh, but which we might consider as a future work, uh, is to observe that this higher order approach and this disentangled approach are not mutually exclusive because they one treats a property of the model and another one uh, treats more um, conceptual um, expansion of, of, uh, of the model. Uh, so a um, uh, future work would be to combine both in the, in the future. So these are just like some references again to the work I've been presenting today. Uh, so XAI for analyzing uh, proteomics data and this uh, higher order and disentangled XAI. Uh, also want to remind our uh, review paper which we published uh, two years ago. It contains uh, some more. Um, Classical topics of explainable AI, also a bit of higher order. It does not contain uh, disentangled XAI. Um, and also to visit our, our website, uh, heatmapping.org, where we put some uh, online some code and demos for our XAI methods, as well as our full list of papers. So with this, I'm, I'm done. And uh, thank you for your attention.